Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In this video, we're going to introduce the singular value decomposition, that's often abbreviated as the SVD. The SVD is a very useful technique in numerical linear algebra that provides us with a lot of insight into a matrix's structure. We'll first introduce the SVD, and then we'll show how it has many useful properties, such as allowing us to calculate the condition number of matrix, or allowing us to calculate the pseudo-inverse of matrix efficiently. The singular value decomposition is a really useful matrix factorization, and the starting point for the singular value decomposition is really geometrical in origin. And suppose we have a matrix A of size n by n, and we think of A as a linear transformation of space. Now let's look at the unit sphere, S. And if we apply A to S, then its image will be a hyperellipse. And a hyperellipse in m-dimensional space will be defined in terms of stretches sigma1 up to sigma m along a set of orthogonal vectors u1 up to um. Let's illustrate this by looking at a 2 by 2 matrix A. So we have the unit circle, in this case S, and we apply our matrix A to it, then we'll get an ellipse, and that will be defined in terms of principal semi-axes, which have size sigma1 times u1 and sigma2 times u2, where u1 and u2 are orthogonal. Now, we can write down that v1 and v2 are the pre-images of sigma1 u1 and sigma2 u2, respectively. And suppose now that we break down our transformation A into three components. We could first take our vectors v1 and v2, and we could apply a rotation to align v1 and v2 with the coordinate directions. We could then apply the stretches of sigma1 and sigma2 along the coordinate directions, and then we could apply rotation to move the coordinate directions to be aligned with u1 and u2. And if we think about the action of A in terms of these three components, then we can see that the v1 and v2 have to themselves be orthogonal. Based on this picture, we can now make some general definitions. Let's define the sigma1 to sigma n to be the singular values, and these will all be greater than or equal to zero, and typically we order them so that sigma1 is greater than or equal to sigma2, and so on. We'll define the left singular vectors, u1 up to un, to be the unit vectors in the directions of the principal semi-axes of a times s, and we'll define the right singular vectors to be v1 up to vn, to be the pre-images of the ui, so specifically a multiplied by vi is equal to sigma i times ui, for all i from 1 to n. And if we now write out this key equation, then we can think of it in matrix form. So we'll have our matrix A applied to our matrix of vectors v, and that will be equal to our matrix of vectors u, multiplied by a diagonal matrix where we have our singular values, sigma1 to sigma n, along the diagonal. And therefore, more compactly, we could have that a multiplied by v is equal to u hat times sigma hat. So here, sigma hat will be an n by n diagonal matrix with non-negative real entries. u hat will be an m by n matrix with orthonormal columns and v will be an n by n matrix with orthonormal columns. And therefore v is an orthogonal matrix, so we'll have v transpose v is equal to v v transpose is equal to the identity, and we therefore end up with a reduced singular value decomposition that we abbreviate to reduced SVD, and for any matrix A of size n by n, we'll have then that A is equal to u hat times sigma hat times v transpose. We'll notice that there's a similarity to the way the QR decomposition was constructed. And just as with QR, we can pad the columns of u hat with m minus n arbitrary orthogonal columns to obtain a full orthogonal matrix u. And we'll then need to silence the effect of those arbitrary columns by adding rows of zeros to sigma hat to obtain a full matrix sigma. And that will give us the full SVD, where for a matrix A of size n by n, 
we can write that A is equal to U times sigma times B transpose. And diagrammatically then, we have these two different pictures. In the full SVD, we have our rectangular matrix A that's written in terms of a large square matrix U applied to our matrix sigma that is diagonal but padded with additional zero rows multiplied by our matrix V transpose. In the reduced picture, we eliminate those final m minus n columns of u to obtain our reduced matrix u hat and correspondingly we can remove the zero rows from sigma to obtain sigma hat. There's a theorem that for any matrix A of size m by n there is a full singular value decomposition and furthermore the sigma j are uniquely determined and if A is square and the sigma j are distinct then the vectors uj and vj are uniquely determined up to a sign. And this theorem justifies the statement that we began with that says that the image of the unit sphere under any n by n matrix is a hyperellipse. And suppose we look now at our full SVD, a is equal to u times sigma times v transpose, and we think about its action on the unit sphere s, then we'll see that the orthogonal map v transpose will preserve s, sigma will then stretch s along the coordinate directions, and u will then rotate or reflect the resulting hyperellipse without changing its shape. And in Python we can compute the full SVD and reduced SVD, and we'll take a look at how to do that now. Let's now look at calculating the singular value decomposition in Python and we'll first import the NumPy library and we'll create a random matrix with four rows and two columns. And we'll then calculate the singular value decomposition using the numpy.linalg.svd function. And that will pass back the three components, the u, the sigma and the v. And if we look at u, then we have here a 4x4 four four square matrix. And if we, look at, if we look at s that contains our singular values, we see that these are returned to us as just a vector. And the reason for this is that it's more efficient to pass back a vector than to pass back an entire diagonal matrix with lots of zeros in it. And our matrix V is also orthogonal. So we'll note here that we've got back the full SVD in this case here. Both our U and V are square matrices. If we now call the SVD function and we pass in the option of full matrices equals zero, then in this case, we'll get back a rectangular matrix U, the same singular values and the same V. And we'll see here that the first two columns of our reduced U will match the first two for the full U. One of the reasons the SVD is so useful is that many basic matrix properties can be read directly from the SVD form. And we'll take a look at several examples of this now. Firstly, the rank R of our matrix A is given by the number of non-zero singular values. And to prove this, let's look at the full SVD of the matrix A. So you write this as U times sigma times V transpose. And since U and V transpose are orthogonal matrices, they have full rank. Therefore, from linear algebra, we know that the rank of A is just equal to the rank of sigma, and hence it follows that the rank of A is just equal to the number of non-zero singular values. Further, we know that the image of A is equal to the span of the vectors u1 up to ur, and the null space of A is equal to the span of the vectors vr plus 1 up to vn. And again, this follows from the SVD form. If we have A is equal to u times sigma times v transpose, then we can see that the image of sigma is equal to the span of e1 or to er, and the null space of sigma is equal to the span of er plus 1 up to en. And if we therefore think about 
rotating these spaces according to the actions of u and v, then we can arrive at the result. The SVD also gives us a good way to think about defining rank for the finite precision arithmetic case. Suppose we define a tolerance, then we can say that if our singular values are below that tolerance, then we'll treat them as being zero. Now let's look at the induced Euclidean norm for our matrix A. And this will work out to be sigma 1, the singular value of largest magnitude. Previously, when we looked at the induced Euclidean norm, we found that if we looked at a diagonal matrix, then the induced Euclidean norm will just be equal to the term on the diagonal of largest magnitude. And here, we're now able to generalize that picture to arbitrary matrices. And we see that it's really the singular values that are important in determining the value of this norm. And to derive this result, we can think about it geometrically. If we recall, the induced Euclidean norm of a matrix A can be written as the maximum of all vectors V with magnitude 1 in norm of the Euclidean norm of A times V. And if we think about the SVD as mapping the unit sphere to a hyperellipse, then we can see that our vector v will get mapped to the vector of largest magnitude when that aligns with the principal semi-axis sigma 1 times v1. And therefore we can conclude that the induced Euclidean norm for our matrix A will just be equal to sigma 1. In addition, the singular values of A are the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A or A A transpose. And let's look at the case for A transpose A. So we can write A transpose A in terms of U sigma V transpose all transpose times U sigma V transpose. And that could be written out as V sigma U transpose U sigma V transpose. And the U transpose U will vanish, so we'll be left with V sigma transpose sigma V transpose. And from that we can conclude that A transpose A applied to V is equal to V times sigma transpose sigma. And that tells us that A transpose A applied to the jth column of V is equal to the jth column of V multiplied by sigma j squared. So we see that there's this relationship between our singular values squared and the eigenvalues of A transpose A. In addition, we also see that the eigenvectors are given by the columns Vj. The pseudo-inverse can also be defined more generally in terms of the SVD. And we'll first define the pseudo-inverse of a scalar sigma to be equal to 1 over sigma if sigma is not equal to 0, and 0 otherwise. And then we'll define the pseudo-inverse of a possibly rectangular diagonal matrix, i.e. one that may be padded with additional 0 rows or columns, as the transpose of that matrix and taking the pseudo-inverse of each entry. Therefore, the pseudo-inverse of a general n by n matrix A can be defined as the pseudo-inverse of A is equal to V times the pseudo-inverse of sigma multiplied by U transpose. And this will exist for any matrix A, and it captures all of the previous definitions that we gave before. We can generalize the condition number to rectangular matrices by saying that the condition number of matrix A is equal to the norm of A multiplied by the norm of its pseudo-inverse. And we can use the SVD to compute the two-norm condition number. We know that the Euclidean norm of A will just be equal to sigma max, the singular value of largest magnitude, and the largest singular value of the pseudo-inverse will be equal to 1 over sigma min, the singular value of smallest magnitude of our matrix A. And therefore, the Euclidean norm of the pseudo-inverse will just be equal to 1 over sigma min. And hence, we can find that the condition number of our matrix A will be given in terms of this ratio between the maximum singular value and the minimum singular value. And this also generalizes our previous calculations of condition number for diagonal matrices.
These results indicate the importance of the SVD, both theoretically and as a computational tool. And algorithms for calculating the SVD are an important topic in numerical linear algebra, but they're going to be outside the scope of this course. And we'll find that for an n by n matrix, it requires 4 times n times n squared minus 4 thirds n cubed operations to compute. And for more details on algorithms, you can see a number of the textbooks, such as the textbook by Trefethen and Bao or Golub and Van Loon.